Hi, I'm about to put my raised beds in my yard and I want to make sure that I don't have a nematode problem. So I'm at the University of Florida's extension website to see what I can do to keep them out of my raised beds. These raised beds are going to sit on the ground. I'm going to put a weed barrier on the bottom under the bed and then I'm going to put some cardboard on the bottom and then all new soil, organic matter, which um, apparently nematodes don't really like, so I want to discourage them from getting in, try to prevent them from getting in as much as possible. And I'm going to plant a ton of marigolds with my plants because I read that they don't like that as well. So I want to see if there's anything else I can find out. And nematode management in the vegetable garden is an article that they have here and they say that due to our warm temperatures, sandy soil and humidity, Florida has more than its fair share of microscopic pests and pathogens. Plant parasitic nematodes can be among the most damaging and hard to control of these organisms. And what are they? They are microscopic. There are many types found in Florida soil. Most nematodes are beneficial feeding on bacteria, fungi, and other microscopic organisms. Some can be used as biological control organisms to help manage important insect pests. However, plant parasitic nematodes feed on live plants on their roots and are detrimental to the garden. And what they do, they are, they get into the roots and cause damage, suck up nutrients, and the damaged roots of the plants have a very hard time absorbing water or nutrients. Here is a picture of a human hair and a nematode, one of the larger ones, which you may be able to see without a microscope because you can see hair, obviously, but most of them are microscopic. And here is a picture of some that are, are inside the roots, migratory nematodes. So this, oh, they're stained red, so we can see them, and they're tunneling through a root. And so they're moving. Some tunnel around, and some get in there and sit, and some stay, don't enter the root. They just stick their stylet into the root, and that's like a hypodermic needle, and then just from the outside suck out the nutrients. And here is a picture of nematodes, young ne nematodes, juvenile nematodes. Then they're getting bigger and molting several times. And then a, an adult female with eggs and then peeled back root so you could see the nematode there. Root tissue pulled back to show the adult female nematode. So how do they damage plants? They damage the root system and reduce the ability of a plant to obtain water and nutrients from the soil. When the nematode numbers get high, so when they're pre reproducing, the numbers will get higher and higher if you don't control them. Or when environmental stresses occur, then you'll see above ground symptoms and you might not know what's going on. Here we have a patch of corn that looks like it's not getting enough water, but it's a nematode problem. Also, there's a patch of beans, same problem. And a patch of strawberries with nematode areas affecting that. So nobody wants that in the garden. Carrots can be, um, you can see, nematode causes forking of carrots. So you're not getting your nice, long, beautiful carrots. And so the most common in Florida are root knot, sting, all, and stubby root nematodes. Root knot nematodes are the most well-known of plant parasitic nematodes. And there are several species that are common in Florida. So there's not even just one root knot nematode. There are several species um, that are common in Florida, so possibly many more than that that aren't in Florida. These are sedentary endoparasites, so they enter the root and stay there, sedentary, and feed in one place. 
They inject hormones into the roots and cause knots or galls to form. So if you pull the roots up thinking that you're going to diagnose the problem and you see these galls or knots, it's a root knot nematode. But you cannot, don't confuse it with when, when you look at peas, legumes that have a nitrogen um, pod. Those are good things and you can just till those back into your soil and they'll release nitrogen. But these are the galls, damaged root knot nematodes. And they high infestations can kill many types of vegetables. Some most commonly damaged are tomatoes, and I'm planning on growing tomatoes, so that's a concern. Okra, potatoes, beans, peppers. That's another one I want to do. Peppers, eggplants, peas, cucumbers, carrots, field peas, squash, and melons. So some other ones I want to do as well. And I don't want to have them ruined by these nematodes. Ectoparasites. So the ectoparasites don't go into the root. They pierce it with their stylet, hypodermic needle, and suck out the nutrients. And feeding by these nematodes causes roots to be stunted or to look stubby. So the most destructive of these are the sting, the awl, and the stubby root nematodes. All nematodes, A-W-L, all nematodes, are usually found in wet habitats such as near ditches, ponds, or poorly drained areas. Now, I don't think I'm going to have a wet area. Stubby, several stubby root species are found in Florida. Wait, sting nematodes are found in sandy soil and are common throughout much of Florida. So if I had sandy soil, that could be a problem. Sting all and stubby root. And there are several stubby root species. One or more can usually be found in most Florida habitats. Other ectoparasitic nematodes that parasitize some types of vegetables are spiral, stunt, and ring nematodes. There's just no end to these nematodes. And here's a, I guess this is a, a plant with stubby roots. I guess they're cut off there from the nematode, piercing it and cutting off its supply of energy, nutrients, water. Other nematodes, there are more. Reniform and cyst nematodes are sedentary, occasionally damaged vegetables. These do not cause galls. Root symptoms are generally unthrifty root systems. They're limited to soils with high silt content. Most in Florida, often found in homestead area and parts of the panhandle. So hopefully I don't have to worry about that kind. I'm not in that area. They are damaging to many crops. They cause a lesion. Lesion and lance limitodes are migratory. They, that means they move inside the roots. Endoparasites that are common in Florida soils. So that one I could have to worry about. The, these nematodes usually cause dark, sullen areas called lesions on roots. So this one looks bruised. And that can make the plants acceptable to root rot and vascular wilt diseases. How do I know if I have a problem? Okay, you can, for $20, send a sample to Florida. If it's a, or 25 for outside of Florida. <clears throat> Use their forms and send it to the nematode assay lab and do not send soil samples in soil test bags. Okay, so they need, if you're going to send a soil sample in, which I don't think I'm going to do right now because I don't want to spend $20 for each section of my yard. Um, I think I'm going to try to prevent having them come and then if I do need to diagnose it later on, I will then have a soil sample done. But if you do it, you have to do it in a special, uh, follow the special procedures so that the soil is not dry and the nematodes don't die when you're sending it in. And here are the things we can do about it. There's no chemical nemicide. 
no poison to control to kill nematodes. <clears throat> that have been effective in University of Florida trials. Bionemicides. So there are there is this Melocon WG. It contains a fungus that parasitizes nematode eggs. So it fungus that gets on the eggs of the nematodes and causes them to be, I guess, die or to not be able to reproduce. And it's something that you get delivered directly to you from the manufacturer, frozen, and then you mix it with water, drench the area, and redo it a few times. I don't know how to get that. I don't know where I would get that or how to get it. I guess I could Google it. Um, but I'm not going to do that right now because I'm going to use all new soil in my bed, so I'm going to have my fingers crossed that I have clean, good, organic soil that nematodes don't like. They don't like organic. Um, they like the sandy soil. So if I keep a barrier on the bottom with the weed barrier and the cardboard, hopefully they just don't come in and then it will be an unwelcome environment with all the organic bioactivity going on in the bed. If I have a problem later, I guess I could take this, order some of this Melocon WG and treat the bed to reduce that nematode population. Resistance and tolerance. So you can get plants that are resistant and or tolerant. And plants that a particular nematode cannot reproduce on are termed resistant. So it's resistant to nematodes the nematode can eat it, I suppose, but they can't reproduce on it. And that means the population is not increasing. So if you can get that, plants that are resistant, that's going to help it. That's going to help my, if I can get resistant plants, that'll help my, keep my bed free of nematodes or not out of control with high populations of nematodes. And then the tolerant ones, they're tolerant. They are plants that can be plants that can be reproduced on by the nematode but are not damaged are termed tolerant. So you you could still get vegetables. But it says these plants can still be damaged by other species of root knot nematodes or other types of nematodes. Still, it's best to use these varieties when root knot is present. So there's a table listing some of the more popular vegetables grown in Florida and the nematodes that damage each one. If a nematode assay, so if you have a soil sample sent in and they say you have a certain type of nematode, possible to plant another crop that will not be damaged by that nematode. And some vegetable varieties are marked nematode resistant. That refers only to one or two species of root knot nematodes. These plants may still be damaged by other species of root knot nematodes or other types of nematodes. And then solar soil solarization basically uses heat from the sun to kill nematodes and other pests. I'm not going to do that because I'm going to have all new soil. But what they're basically doing is covering the soil with plastic, weighting it down by burying the ends. That's not really going to my page. There it is. Way of burying the ends of the plastic so it's sealing in the moist. You wet the soil first, moisten it and dig it up and get all the roots out. So getting out the eggs, there could be, in the roots there can be nematodes, there could be eggs of nematodes, so you wanna get them out. And then you wanna moisten the soil, put the plastic over it, seal the plastic around by burying it under soil. Let it sit there during June, July, August, and kill everything in there. Once you take that off, you don't wanna till the soil because you might dig up the nematodes that are deeper down. This is only going to kill 
the top layer. So maybe, what did it say, six to eight inches deep. Do not mix or till the soil after solarization. And then once you, and you can only do this, um, only solarize planting beds that get full sun. It won't work in the shade. And then you want to use the soil right away after you finish doing it. You can plant a cover crop. That is a crop that is not harvested. It's planted in between harvestable crops. Okay, so here's an important point. Because most vegetables in Florida are grown in the spring or fall, cover crops are usually grown in the summer or winter. So you can grow a summer crop, summer cover crop, and then till it into the soil, and then grow your fall vegetables. Then do another cover crop in the winter, and then till that into the soil, and then have a spring garden. You will be losing your summer gardening time and your winter gardening time because I think there are some things you can plant during that time as well, but what can you do if you have problems? Cover crops may be used to decrease soil pests. Select one that's resistant to the common nematode that you are most concerned about. Because the nematode cannot reproduce well on this resistant cover crop, the numbers will decline over time. And then the damage from nematodes to the next crop, so when you put your vegetables in the next time, it'll be less severe due to the lower population densities. And there's table two, there's a list of cover crops and what they can help with. So that's something to do if you have a problem. I'm hoping not to have a problem from the beginning. Organic amendments. This is what I'm going to start with. My idea is to start with good soil. Organic amendments can be added to soil if compost, manure, green manure, or other materials. Organic matter can help prevent nematode damage in several ways. The organic matter increases the ability of the soil to hold water and nutrients, and it improves soil structure. This makes a better environment for most plants and can help plants survive in spite of the nematodes. And it can increase natural enemies of nematodes that suppress the nematode populations. Some organic amendments can release chemicals or gases that are toxic to the nematodes. So that's what I need to find out. What can you add that is an amendment that can release chemicals or gases that are toxic to them? There are several organic nematode management products for sale. And I guess that's what they're talking about here. Researchers with the University of Florida have worked with a number of these, but probably not all of them. In the majority of cases, these products work no better than adding any less expensive organic material. So actually, the cheapest way to go, and it's not cheap, is compost, manure, green manure, and other compo um, compostable material. That's going to give your plants a fighting chance, make it a increase the bioactivity in the soil, bring hopefully beneficial nematodes and other things. Natural enemies of nematodes to suppress the population. And then planting. And so annual plants grown in cooler months do not suffer as much from nematodes as those grown in warmer months. So if you're planting a summer garden, then it's going to be the worst time for nematodes if you have them. Fall, winter, and spring gardens will be the better time. So become familiar with temperature requirements of the plant. Grow as early as possible in the spring or as late as possible in the fall. So you want to do it in that cooler weather. And use older transplants. They are generally more resistant to nematodes than younger ones. Because they're more established, the roots are bigger. But you have to inspect 
all the roots of any plants that you're going to transplant into your soil because a nursery could have a nematode problem and you could be putting it right into your garden. So you want to look at those roots and see how they look. Soil tillage and root destruction. So you don't want to leave any roots after the garden's done. You don't want to leave any roots in there that may have nematode eggs or nematodes in them because that can support nematode reproduction and the population can increase. The only thing you want to leave in there would be if you're planting marigolds that they don't like. Nematodes don't like French marigolds. Plant them and then till it into the soil. That is going to be something that they're not going to want to eat, they're not going to be in, and it's going to be a deterrent for them to even get into that soil. So other than that, any crops that are harvested, pull up all the plants, get rid of them. Till the soil with a rototiller or a hoe, remove all the roots, roots that might harbor nematodes. Exposure to sunlight and drying kills the nematodes. So working the soil several times can help reduce nematode populations. So you till it, wait a few days, till it some more, wait a few days or a week, whatever, till it some more. And that can help not only kill weeds, but also nematodes. And growing in containers is probably the best thing off the ground. And of course, make sure that you inspect any transplanted plants. Check the roots. You don't want to introduce a problem. Use clean potting media and don't mix it in any native soil. Don't use unclean garden, garden tools that you use in another part of your yard because you could be moving them right into your garden. All right, so now we have a whole table here of different types of nematodes, par plant parasitic nematodes, not the good nematodes, and the plants that they affect and cover crops that could be a control. And I'm interested right now in the French marigold because it's good for root knot, poor for sting. Root knot is the most common, so I'm hoping that it'll work against that. And also, I've heard that marigolds are a good companion plant in general, it's keeping away all kinds of bugs. So what I'm getting from this is that I should be okay with um, my new soil and keep it as organic as possible. A lot of compost, increase the bioactivity of the soil, put my marigold thin, and hopefully that's okay. If I have a problem, I'll then have to diagnose it by looking at the roots, but maybe I shouldn't be so, so paranoid about the nematodes, but I am because my dad, who's been here about 20 years, keeps telling me about his flower beds that are in the ground, how the nematodes are killing everything. He's been saying that for ever since I got here, so it's been about two years now. Now that I'm getting ready to start my raised bed vegetable garden, I'm pretty paranoid about the nematodes. But do you blame me?